Settle. 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 Sett
malformed, deformed, and unnaturally happy. Um, Jeff Helgus and I have a uh, Jeff Helgus and I, Jeff Helgeson from Collage Productions and me from Putting Head Press have a reading coming up at the Galway Arms on Halloween. It's our Halloween literary potpourri. And we are supposed to dress up in costumes, right? Yes. Oh, yeah. Costumes are encouraged. I don't know if I'm going to dress up in costumes or not. Last, last Halloween, last Halloween, I wound up emceeing a like musical karaoke show called the Nightmare, the Halloween Nightmare on Elm Street at the, the 12 West Elm in, in, um, in uh, the Rush Street area. And I don't know anything about monster musicals and stuff like that, but it was a fun time. We have some people who are going to, from that, who are going to come to this thing too. So. Uh, we're going to be doing, hopefully we're going to be doing a Lights Out production called The Dark. I don't know if anybody, who, any, have any of you heard The Dark from Lights Out? Heard okay, off. Jeff's heard of it. Okay, it's one of the best, scariest things that was ever on old time radio. We're going to do that. I'm going to do some um, horror short stories. And um, we're going to have some scenes from A. Macbeth and some other stuff like that. Jeff's going to do some Edgar Allan Poe. We have Esteban doing his uh, Telltale Heart in Dr. Zeus style, which is going to be cool. But I want to read a Halloween, a short story that's set on Halloween. I can't say it's a monster story or a scary story, but it's set on Halloween, and it's called The Night Fat Boy Played Pool. Fat Boy loved his daddy. His mother told him to. That's your father. Give him respect, she said. He knew that there was something wrong, but being inside it all, he didn't know any better. His father worked hard, shoveling snow, looking through garbage from metal, cleaning out basements and barns, but his limp, limp kept him at home. He was on some kind of assistance. That boy didn't know what that meant, really, but he knew it meant that he didn't have the things that all the other kids in town did. He hated his daddy. Not that he beat them all that much when he stumbled home drunk. He beat them just enough. Just enough. Just enough. He was mostly waiting. It was mostly the waiting and the fear. What would happen when he came home? Fat boy always tried to do things right. He was careful when he washed the dishes or put the garbage out. If he didn't, his daddy would remind him. If his mother didn't, she would be reminded too. It was always better at home when he did things just right. Occasionally the police would bring his father home and he would be okay for a while. He would mostly hide in the basement, drink beer, and play pool. The pool table fascinated Fat Boy. It was something that the other kids didn't have. The wide expanse of green, the cleanest thing in the house. But Fat Boy wasn't allowed to get within five feet of it. Don't touch my balls, boy, his daddy would say, and laugh evilly in his cracking voice. You can play with your balls all you want, but leave mine alone. That boy knew it was some kind of dirty comment. He watched his mother blush every time he said it. He saw her blush just about every time they were in public. He knew that the people of Leadtown hated his father, and that spilled over into hating Fat Boy. His father returned the hate. You'd think it'd be hard for a man to hate an entire town. He made it look easy. He would stand on High Street outside the bars and shout at people in the streets. He would fling rocks at the windows when the buildings were empty. All this reflected on Fat Boy. He was friendless. It's not that he was not friendly, in fact, he tried to be as friendly as possible. He tried to do everything right. He was a class clown and was as socially awkward as his father and as socially awkward as his father had made his mother. He did not even notice he was the butt of everyone's jokes. 
He would spend all day at school being shoved around by even the smallest schoolmates. Then one night, his daddy died in his sleep. He came home drunk and sometime during the night died on the couch. His mouth was filled with foam and spittle. That boy was the man of the house now and he knew that the balls were his. He would go downstairs and stare at them for hours, but he was afraid of them. He never touched them, just like his daddy had said. At Halloween, that boy dressed up like a hobo, but he really didn't think of it that way. He was dressing up like his father. Just like the other kids, he went door to door. Unlike the other kids, he went door to door alone. He had a big cloth cloth sack that said feedback. When he rang the doorbell, someone would answer. He would open his bag and they would drop in one piece of candy. Sometimes making a face or hardly opening the door at all. Almost no one spoke to him. He knew he was not doing something right. He just didn't know what it was. He wondered why he was doing this. Other kids enjoyed this. He, of course, wanted the candy. His mother always gave it to him when he was good, and he felt that somehow he was being rewarded now, but he was also felt like he was being punished. He wandered alone. Everyone kept away from him. Then suddenly walking with his head down, he bumped into someone. It was Cowboy, one of the nicest kids in school. He wore a gorilla mask. Hey, fat boy, where are you going, he said. Fat boy turned his sad face to Cowboy. Why are you out late by yourself, Cowboy said. What do you mean late? It's late. I'm going home. I got so much candy I can hardly carry it. How'd you do? Cowboy lifted up his sack of candy. It was bulging and jangled as coins banged against one another. All the stores along Main Street and High Street gave me money, and I got some cars and stuff. Fat Boy looked in the cowboy's bag. It was full. Fat Boy's bag didn't jingle. It was empty compared to Cowboy's. Well, I gotta run. I gotta get home, Cowboy said, and began to jog, jog down the streets. He did not really want to be seen with Fat Boy anyways. Fat Boy went home. He turned on the TV. There was monsters and creatures on TV. He turned slowly from channel to channel. He found Son of Frankenstein. He stopped. He always knew, he, he always knew then that he was not like other kids. Something wasn't right. And it was his father. He was the son of Frankenstein. He went into the little kitchen, found a bag and a knife. He slashed awkwardly at the bag. His big, bat, his big fat fingers not as useful as they normally were at this moment. He cut out eye holes and a mouth. He opened the drawer where the markers were kept that his mother used to mark his shoes, L for left, R for right. He wrote Frankenstein across the front of the bag. He went downstairs and looked at the pool table. There was a little dust on it, and his mother had left some clothes on it. He threw these to the ground. He took his daddy's pool stick and began to crush each piece of candy and grind it into the green felt. It felt good. The harder he ground, the better it felt. He wrote Frankenstein across the pool, pool table with the marker. That felt good too. Lots of candy went into the dark holes in the corner and at the side of the pool table. He expected to see some come out at the bottom where the balls were, but none did. He took his father's balls and stared, and starting with the one ball, crushed candy beneath them. He thought about how many years he had lived and crushed a piece of candy with each ball. One crunch, two crunch, three crunch. He got all the way up to ten. He especially enjoyed the eight ball that his father put so much importance on. 
When he reached number 10, his age, he was out of candy. It had all gone down holes or been crunched beneath his anger. He stared at the balls, each one a different color, each one with its own number. There was a comfort in that orderliness. The numbers made sense. There was a comfort in the feel of them in his hand, each one seeming like a weapon. Cannonballs, he thought. Though he had never seen one, he thought, cannonballs. They were his father's, and he loved them, and he hated them at the same time. He threw them in the now empty candy sack. It made it seem as heavy as cowboys, and it rattled as he shook it. It seemed more like a weapon than the balls did separately, and he swung it back and forth, back and forth. He too hated this town. He got the leftovers in this town. The other boys, like Cowboy, got all the good stuff. They got the good life. He knew that he could never get it right. Behind the pool table was a pile where his mother had thrown his father's clothes. They were big, Frankenstein clothes, they seemed. He slid on his father's shoes over his own. The fit was perfect. He put on his father's coat. It didn't fit very well, but it made him feel more like Frankenstein. He slowly put the paper bag over his head. He quietly closed the door and walked over to High Street with the sack over his shoulder. His father's least prized possession carrying his father's most prized possession. He reached High Street, the highest point in town. He stood near the post office. It was midnight and the whole street was empty. It was Sunday and the bars were closed and there was not a person or car visible. The street seemed wider than it had ever seemed before. As you looked down the street, it sloped gently at first and then disappeared all of a sudden as the slope increased. He sat in the middle of the street. It was quiet. He reached into the bag and found the yellow ball, the first one. He held it in both hands and looked at it one last time. He simply dropped it. It bounced with a loud, hollow sound, stopped, and began to roll. It took a turn to the right, hit the curb, and spun to the other side of the street. It rolled faster and faster until, over by the hardware store, it disappeared over the edge where he could no longer see. It clicked several times on the street before he heard the smash. Cannonballs, he thought. He pulled at ball number two and let it roll slowly down the streets. He watched as it bounced from curb to curb. Before it reached the hardware store, it had left the curb and bounced along the sidewalk and then disappeared. Ball three, ball four, and eventually the honored eight ball. By, the time he was, by that time, he was throwing them down the street, watching them bounce and disappear over the edge. It was quicker to throw them to let them roll, and the smashing sound came quicker, and that was more satisfying. He threw the last ball as hard and as far as he could. He didn't know when he stood up. He didn't know when he began to smile beneath his mask with that same grimace that his father had. He never walked down and looked at the bottom of the hill. He was done. He walked home with his best Frankenstein walk. He knew he really was a monster now. In the morning, when he woke up, when he woke up, he pulled off his father's coat and squeezed out of his shoes before his mother could see him. But the coat had already transferred the smell of his father to him. Fat Boy. People keep on telling me, oh no, you can't leave Fat Boy like that. Yes, I could. I made him. I could destroy him. <laughs> I'm sleeping on a bed of nails. How can you expect me to be comfortable? Spikes jab at me with every opportunity. No wonder you won't sleep with me on this bed of nails. You fear to become stuck 
like those little balls you toss against Velcro. I wake in the morning with impressions on my skin. It creates quite an interesting pattern. It seems to spell your name in tiny bits of dried blood. Um, I'm missing a poem I wanted to do. Okay, I'll do this. This is for Bob, because I know he likes this. <laughs> and I want to get ready for my next story, so I'm going to do this. It's called Omaha. Oh, Omaha, I love you for your plainness. I once knew a girl from Omaha. She was exotic, exciting, and somehow simple, somehow sexy in her simplicity. She was one of your lost children. I saw that girl the other day, and she did not seem that simple anymore. Oh, Omaha, I love you for your black and whiteness. Oh, Omaha, I love the way your lights shine at night with no pretense or apology. I love you how ugly you are, but do not apologize for. Oh, Omaha, I love you because I have not shared your tastes, likes, or dislikes. And oh, Omaha, I love you because I can no longer enjoy the simple things. Enjoy the simple things that you are. It's not that simple anymore and I am caught in the middle. It's not that simple anymore and I can't enjoy the simple things. Oh, Omaha, I remember what I once was and what you could have been to me. All this indecision in my life. It's such a waste of time. I can't really take it anymore. You see, it's only Omaha, and it's left or right, and it's black or white, and there's no shades of sadness or happiness in between in anything that you do. It's only Omaha. It either is or it isn't. You turn the light on, you turn the light off. It's either on or off, and if you want to leave it on, leave it on. There's no reason to put dimmer switches in your life. It's only Omaha, and indecision does not exist here. There are no doubts. It's either on or off. It's either left or right, dark or bright. Oh, Omaha, I will not measure out my life in coffee spoons. I will not debate eating a peach. I will swallow it or spit it out. I will digest it or shit it out. These are the rules. Oh, Omaha, the air is so clear here. Don't dim the lights for the neighbors. Don't dim the lights for anyone. It's pretty simple. It's black or white, left or right. They don't paint things gray in Omaha. Take it or leave it. Ambiguity has no address in this town. But tonight, oh Omaha, I am on your outskirts. There is a stop sign and I come to a rolling stop. And oh Omaha, I want to run your yellow lights. Okay, now, where is this? Where is it? Where is this? Where is that? Where is that? Um, it's been a long day, folks. And I'm looking for this page that I just had here. You look like you're doing a Jerry Pendergast imitation. Can't find it. Uh, yes, I am. I've been studying you for years. <laughs> it was a bit of a mistake. I called you from Omaha. I called you from Omaha and you answered the phone. And now it's either right or left, black or white. There's no in-between in anything I feel about you. I made a mistake from Omaha and indecision no longer exists here. I feel it even now, a slight caress of my ankles, tiny fingers. Sometimes you can let things wash over you, but there's always an undertow calling you forward. It is usually stronger and it draws me in your direction. I could drown in your ocean linger in the chambers of the sea. I shall name this place Omaha Beach. 
I shall not wear my trousers rolled. I shall not walk along your beach and eat a peach. I have heard the mermaids singing, and I think they will sing for me. And with a simple word from you, I can drown. It must have been some chemical accident, a beaker exploding, cover me, covering me with some strange potion, shifting me to some wavelength that your eyes have adapted not to see. I am a ghost now in your life, an invisible man. You never see me anymore. It's not that we are never in the same room anymore. It's when you walk by me in the streets never noticing. We used to touch and your body quivered when I was near. It doesn't quiver for me now. Does it quiver for another? I'm just a ghost in your life. Okay, now we get to the weird stuff. Um, Working alone on a chain gang Haunts me at night when I call out your name Since you've gone there's been nothing the same Scraps of paper and cookies Reminds me of time and just how things should be Oh I wish it went not meant nothing to me So I write it all down on paper Try to describe to myself what I see. Don't know how this could possibly be. I watch the lines on the page change. I hope the lines on my hands would change too. I wish they would bring me to you. That's one of those bad poems I was looking at. Where were you when the page was empty? Where were you when it was so easy to make things new? Now the page is covered with smudges and the text has been written and somehow set in stone. When it was empty, we could have written our story, you and I. Now I fear it is too late. I cannot erase this whole page and you and I cannot fit in between the lines that are already on the page. Where were you when it was empty? It could never be empty again. And where were you? You were gone somehow. Even though you were still there, you were gone. Should I do a short story? No, a short. <laughs> should I do a two-minute short story or should I do a poem? Okay, I'm gonna do a two-minute short story. He pulled out the credit card and swiped it through the machine. It beeped again. It still didn't go through. The girl behind the counter said. He put the card into his right front pocket and secretly pulled out another out of his left front. He swiped the card. It wasn't a credit card, it was a gift card. He deposited the card into his back left pocket. Wait, let me try this other card, he said. He knew the girl, he, he knew, the girl knew he was playing a game. Maybe not exactly what the game was, but it was a game, and she didn't seem to mind. He decided she was soft to him, Maybe not to go all the way, but at least to be nice. The cameras couldn't see what he was doing. That's why he picked this place. He finally got one that went through. He smiled at the girl. She showed no sign of knowing the game. He bought two cartons of cigarettes and asked for extra money. We don't do that with that type of card, she said. He walked out rather satisfied with himself. On the street, he met Little Man and handed him the card. He got the others, he said. He handed him two handfuls of cards, one checked and one bad. That all of them? Yes, sir. He gave him a bag of weed. Don't sell none to your friends. Sell it to someone else. 
He took it home and he hid it in the big yellow couch like he did last week and the week before. He was building up quite a stash. He knew that come the next big bust, the price would go up again. It was worth nothing now. It was all about supply and demand. He laughed when he thought he was sitting on a gold mine. When his mama talked about Christmas, she cried and cried. It was about money and supply and demand. She cried a lot lately, but he knew that Christmas was going to be different this year, not like last year. But it was getting colder and there was no big bust. He was going to have to sell his investment when the market was low. It was about supply and demand. He did not know about Rent-A-Center and they intervened in his life. He came home, the couch was gone, and his mama was crying. Looked like there ain't gonna be no Christmas this year. But there was gonna be, he decided. There was gonna be. Because he knew where his brother had hid the gun. In uh, Lincoln Park, just north of Fullerton, and are you going to come? Um, yeah, I think I'm going to be a screaming a lady. I think I'm going to be a screaming lady in your show, so I might be. But ladies and gentlemen, I don't think it was loud enough. One more time. <laughs> Everybody wants to start their singer song in it really, really quickly. So I'm going to say these are bonus weeks. So in two weeks, on the 30th, we've got Cousin Bones playing here. So if you want music and a cool thing to do on the day before Halloween, come on by. Then the next week is back to our normal schedule with November 6th, where we happen to have Bill Yero. We've got Tom Curry on the 20th. If you want to know anything about future schedule stuff, go to chaoticarts.org slash the cafe. That's what I get. I have to breathe so I can even say everything I want. So thank you all so much.